Well, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, I'm grateful to be able to talk a little bit about the autobiography this evening. Uh, I had the privilege last year of working on a new edition of this little book, and I fell in love with it and came to appreciate it in a way that I hadn't before. And I'd love to share just a little bit of that with you. Uh, most Jesuits, believe it or not, didn't even know that the autobiography existed. Uh, until about 50 years ago. Shortly after St. Ignatius dictated it, it went onto a bookshelf where it stayed until about the 1960s. And if you remember, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s invited Jesuits and all religious orders to go back to their original sources and to study them with renewed enthusiasm. And so in the process of doing that, of responding to the call of the council, uh, uh, Jesuits rediscovered this little book and began to read it in earnest. And so now, 50 years later, together with the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and the constitutions of St. Ignatius, the autobiography, those three, are probably the three texts that Jesuits and friends gravitate toward the most in order to form our self-understanding, who we are and our mission today. And so, uh, believe it or not, uh, Ignatius was very reluctant at first to dictate his memoirs. Uh, near the end of his life, he died in 1556, about two years before he died, uh, some of his aides came to him and asked him to dictate his life story for future Jesuits you know, because they knew that they would want to know something about their founder. And Ignatius was very reluctant to do it at first, and he dragged his leg for a couple of years. Uh, but then the early Jesuits said something to him which prompted him to change his mind. And I'm going to hold off on telling you what that is for a second. I'm going to save that for the end, okay? Because it's key to what the autobiography is all about. Uh, Ignatius then, when he dictates his life story, he's not telling it simply to satisfy uh, random curiosity, idle curiosity about his life. He is very consciously trying to preserve certain key themes that he wants Jesuits and friends to remember about the uh, Jesuit spirituality, the Jesuit charism. And so you see certain themes pop up in this book over and over again. Uh, the heart of Jesuit spirituality, Jesuit, Jesuit spirituality, as Ignatius makes clear uh, in the Constitutions, and in the exercises as well, and the autobiography, is the greater glory of God. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. And I think many people assume that when Jesuits say for the greater glory of God, that they intend it simply as an inspirational phrase meant to get people excited. But in reality, Ignatius meant something very specific by this, very concrete. And what Ignatius meant was when Jesuits are presented with two or more good options that they can be doing in the service of God, all else being equal, try to choose that option which is going to make a bigger impact on God's people, right? And so whenever we glorify anyone, we are drawing attention to that person. So if I, if I point to my friend and I ask you to look at my friend and say, see what a wonderful cook she is or a pianist or whatever it is, I am drawing people's attention to her trying to get them to notice her and to rejoice in her gifts. And so that is what we do when we glorify God, of course. We are trying to draw human beings' attention to God and to acknowledge 
to recognize and to rejoice in his truth, his power, his beauty, his beauty and his goodness. Okay. And so Ignatius believed that it stands to reason that if we want to love and serve the Lord with all our hearts, we're going to try to choose those options which draw more people's attention to God, which glorify God more. And so this is the theme that you find recurring throughout his autobiography. But he didn't start that way. Okay. So Ignatius was very revolutionary in this regard in the 16th century, this aspect of his spirituality. Uh, in order to understand Ignatius correctly, there are a couple of things that you need to know about the culture of his time. The first thing is, uh, Catholics in the 16th century were generally very anxious about their personal salvation. They generally worried much more than Christians perhaps do today about whether or not they're going to heaven. It weighed very heavily on their minds. And for that reason, it was a very pressing question for Catholics, which forms of life, which kinds of ministry or service in the church are best going to assure their salvation. Okay. And generally speaking, the conventional wisdom of the time was that if you really want to grow in holiness, and assure your salvation, the best way to do that was in monastic life, to dedicate long hours, many hours every day to prayer and asceticism. Okay, now that didn't necessarily mean joining a monastery. Many Catholics would actually become hermits and live out by themselves on the edge of town, or in a small building attached to the side of a church uh, and spend many hours in prayer each day like that. And so Catholics, when Ignatius was alive, were fascinated by the stories of St. Anthony of the Desert. Remember that great monk from the fourth century who is called the father of Christian monasticism and the stories of the desert fathers and mothers uh, in the fourth and fifth centuries fascinated Catholic. Right? And so when Ignatius has this cannonball moment and decides that he wants to give his life to God, he naturally uh, and instinctively gravitates toward this conventional model. He thinks that he's going to be a hermit and he dreams about being a Carthusian. Okay. And uh, so he decides to fast very rigorously, be very harsh with his body, practice a lot of asceticism. And he was spending six, seven, or eight hours a day, a day in prayer. Uh, and then he goes to this little village called Manresa, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. He wants to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to see where Jesus walked. And so he passes through this little village of Manresa, simply expecting to spend a day or two before moving on. But to his surprise, he ends up staying 11 months. And we don't know exactly why he stayed, but he said later that those 11 months were the most transformative and powerful of his entire life. And he said, if you could take all the graces that God gave me for the rest of my life, they would not amount to what I experienced there at Manresa. And when he first got to Manresa, again, he's perpetuating that idea that I'm going to be a hermit and spend my time in prayer. But he started to notice several things. Initially, he sought out holy people in the city to ask them for spiritual advice. He wants to get into spiritual conversations with them 
for the sake of his own spiritual growth. And he's very clear in the autobiography that to his disappointment, those conversations did not edify him <laughs> as, as much as he thought they were going to. They tended to disappoint him. But he was equally surprised by the fact that the conversations seemed to be having a powerful impact on the others that he was speaking to. And he noticed that when he gauged other people for the specific purpose of helping them to see God or to find God in some new way, he met with wonderful success. And so this starts to get him thinking about maybe I should not be so preoccupied with my own spiritual growth per se, in the sense of making that the uh, direct focus, but rather he starts to think that maybe I should be focusing on service to others. Now that might seem like a simple thing to you, but that was huge in the 16th, 16th century because believe it or not, many Catholics were actually ambivalent about the idea of serving others in spiritual or corporal works of mercy, mercy. Because if the emphasis is me avoiding temptation, growing in virtue, and growing in prayer, then if I start engaging other people, it's going to be distracting me from my prayer, dragging me away from it. Or uh, working in the world could lure me into the various sins and temptations of the world. So it's best if I withdraw from it like a monk. And nevertheless, despite this ambiguity or ambivalence among many Catholics, Ignatius comes to the growing conviction that no, I think I am called to serve other people. And this Basic intuition receives a massive confirmation at his mystical experience at the Cardinal River in Manresa. So one day he is praying by the side of the river, which is really kind of a creek by American standards, <laughs> but he's praying by the side of this river and he receives a powerful mystical illumination he didn't have a vision per se, but it was like God opened the top of his head and poured in a profound understanding of how God is intimately present everywhere in the world, in every person, in every place, very much at work. It's a very dynamic presence, very active presence, and God is constantly laboring to bring all creation, all human beings back to him. And so uh, Ignatius literally begins to perceive the world in a different way as a result of this mystical illumination. And it seems to have made him much more optimistic about throwing the net widely, you might say much more optimistic about engaging the world uh, in service and trying to draw them closer to God, as opposed to seeing the world as a broken, fallen place, uh, which is to be avoided. And so notice, of course, how this resonates with certain themes of Pope Francis, right? Pope Francis has been very much emphasizing the idea of the church engaging people on the margins, engaging different cultures, different religions, as ambiguous and fuzzy as that might get for us at times, that's the essence of our mission. And so that optimism of Pope Francis is something that he comes by honestly. It's something that he gets from his Jesuit training. Okay. And so, uh, When Ignatius has this shift to serving the greater glory of God, this has very practical consequences for how he decides all kinds of things. So at first, 
he had thought of himself as being an itinerant, ice, um, uh, a solitary hermit, uh, praying on his own and whatnot. But then he realizes that, especially in the culture of his time, the 16th century, if I'm going to make the biggest impact that I can on God's people, I really need to get a university degree and I really need to get ordained because um, or, uh, because he was not ordained, the church was very suspicious uh, and wary of him teaching the people. You really needed a theology degree for that kind of thing in the mind of the church. And so Ignatius is constantly experiencing uh, interruptions and sometimes investigations by the Inquisition because he doesn't have a degree. And so he says, okay, all right, even though it means that I'm going to have to withdraw from my apostolic service to people for a while, or at least to a large degree, I clearly need to sit down behind a desk and study and get that degree. And so I'm going to forego a smaller good now for the sake of a greater good later. Once I have the degree, uh, the church will trust me with more positions of influence I will be able to engage people more profoundly and things like that. And that basic uh, rationale, Ignatius continually brought to young Jesuits because after he founded the society with his first companions, these young men who are joining the society, like him, like he did, but were obviously very, very passionate and enthusiastic about serving God's people. And they didn't want to be sitting behind a desk studying dry philosophy and theology. Uh, uh, and yet Ignatius said to them in one of his famous letters, you need to do what I did in order to make that greater impact, that greater impact, I need you to sit behind this desk right now. Okay. Um, another way that this influenced Ignatius was that he decided to recruit other men to help him. And as you read the autobiography, you will see, as you can imagine, that whenever you treat others to help you, it's a mixed blessing. He wants others to help him because he believes he's going to make that bigger impact. But then, you know, the others, sometimes they don't always work out. Sometimes they create problems. There's all kinds of irritations and hitches and whatnot that come with organizing any group of people. Uh, and for that reason, any number of reformers in Ignatius's day simply preferred to work alone. But Ignatius believed that despite all the hassles, it was worth it because God would receive greater, greater glory, uh, more people would be impacted if he could work in tandem with companions, okay? Uh, and after Vatican II, the Jesuits take, again, that basic intuition and expand it to our lay friends. If we are gonna make the biggest impact possible that we can on God's people, we Jesuits, we can't do this by ourselves. We need to work with laity and actually for the laity and in many ways have them take the lead in order to promote our mission and to serve that greater glory. And I think, you know, I think most people would agree that the fruits of that decision are very clear, very obvious, and very profound, very exciting. Okay. Um, and then finally, <laughs> uh, Ignatius was elected the first superior general of the society and when his brother Jesuit selected him, he didn't want to do it. He wanted to be out there in the field serving God's people directly. You can imagine. He did not want to be sitting behind a desk in Rome. Uh, but his Jesuit companions reminded him, look, Ignatius, you need to put your money where your mouth is. If this society of Jesus is going to serve that greater glory of God, someone has to steer the ship. All right. And so, again, Ignatius is going to have to sacrifice the, 
the consolations and the enjoyment of that direct pastoral ministry, but he's going to end up impacting the church far more profoundly if he sits behind that desk. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so he's going to serve the greater glory of God in that way. And so this is two, brings up two key ideas in Jesuit spiritual law, which I'm sure you've heard before. And one is indifference. Indifference. This is a word that Ignatius uses in the spiritual exercises and the autobiography and the constitutions. And indifference means, again, when you have two or more good options in front of you, legitimate, morally acceptable things that you can do for God, which one do you believe is going to help you serve that greater glory? And then do you, do you have the freedom to embrace one and let the other one go? And that's what indifference is all about. So if I honestly think in light of my gifts, limitations, and circumstances, that I'm going to serve God's glory more as a married person, then do I have the courage to embrace that and to let the other vocation options go and vice versa? Because I think as we all know from experience, uh, sometimes the hardest things in life are letting a good thing go. Uh, not only literally, but here in our hearts. And yet, we have to be able to let them go, even in our hearts, because if we're always daydreaming about what would have been if we had chosen the other thing, then we'll never really have the freedom and enthusiasm to throw ourselves into what we did choose. And so that is all part and parcel of what Ignatius means by indifference. And the other phrase that you'll see in the autobiography is pure intention. And sometimes Ignatius says right intention or true intention, but they all mean the same thing. Uh, Ignatius, when he uses his phrase, uh, he means making your decisions solely on the base of what you think is going to draw more people to God, what is going to serve the greater glory of God. And so there's a close connection between that indifference and pure intention. There are two different sides of the same, of the same coin. Uh, I would like to end with a particular virtue that was very, very important to Ignatius and very central to his spirituality. And yet I'm not sure that even many Jesuits are aware of this. And it is the virtue of true humility. Okay. Today, when we hear the word humility, we tend to think of uh, putting yourself down, pretending that you're no one, uh, pretending that you don't have certain gifts, that kind of thing. And that is not what the Catholic tradition means by it. True humility, properly understood, understood, means a willingness to acknowledge not only your limitations and your sins and your faults, but also your strengths and your gifts and your special callings. And if you acknowledge either one, for the right reasons and in the right circumstances, then you are being truly humble. So for example, uh, you know, if Albert Einstein were in a room full of people who were trying to figure out how to rescue a rocket that was coming to Earth, and Einstein was the only one in the room who had the intelligence to do the math, it would not be arrogance for him to say, I'm the smartest person in this room. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to let me do the math, okay? Because he's acknowledging the truth and he's doing it for the right reason. 
And so this theme pops up over and over again in Ignatius's writings, because if you are trying to serve the greater glory of God, you are going to start drawing attention to yourself as well. If, if, if your focus is drawing as many people as possible to God, you are going to get caught in that limelight to a certain extent. And so what Ignatius would say is, if I honestly believe that I can serve God's greater glory by being the star of this Jesuit television show, then I should go ahead and do it, even though I know that it's going to draw a lot of attention to myself, as long as your intention is pure. Now, why is this relevant to the autobiography? Because when the early Jesuits asked Ignatius to dictate his memoirs, he initially didn't want to do it because he didn't want to draw the limelight to himself. And his aides, Father Nadal and Father Polanco, told him, Father Ignatius, again, you need to put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> if we're really dedicated to that greater glory of God, then you must dictate your memoirs. Even if it makes people think more highly of you, they need to know what your values are. And the wisdom of what they said to him is evident today. 500 years later, this little book is having a massive impact on Jesuits and friends. And so uh, I will wrap this up by saying that you know that the society today is talking about the universal apostolic preferences. And that word universal is very important because Ignatius used that word as another way of saying for the greater glory of God. He would say, whatever serves the more universal good. And so the society of Jesus today with its four universal apostolic preferences, is saying all else being what particular ministries do we believe that we and our friends are going to make the biggest impact on God's people over the next 10 years? Over the next 10 years? Where are we going to serve that more universal goal? And so that basic idea of the universal apostolic preferences finds its birth in this little book of the autobiography. My question is, looking back on your past, have there been times when the Lord has perhaps asked you to step up and you have felt some resistance in some way where God might have been calling you to a different humility?